50s. Dan Parker crusaded week after week against these gangsters. Dan Parker was the person directly responsible for the Gabe Genovese case, the first case of a manager being convicted of undercover managing. Carmen Basilio's managers knew what Genovese could do for their fighter. What they didn't know was how Carmen would respond. Johnny came to me when I was the number one welterweight, and he says, I'm going to have to hook up with the mob in order for you to get a, world, get a championship fight. I had to satisfy people, otherwise I wouldn't have got nothing. He said, you're going to have to give up some of your percentage of your pay. I said, no way. I'll get my shot, whether I give it to them or not, and I'm not giving it to them. He said, well, you're never going to get a shot. I said, well, time will tell. And I refused to give anything up. Now, whether they did or not, that's their business. I don't know. Genovese done a service for me, and I paid him. Now that his managers had taken in Genovese, Basilio was in the mix. He was part of a round robin with Johnny Saxton and Tony DiMarco, who were set to meet for the welterweight crown. A jolting left hook spins Saxton sideways. DeMarco then pours 17 straight punches to the champion's head. He hit that poor Saxton, and, and he got caught in the ropes in the corner. He couldn't go down. And DeMarco hit him, I don't know how many shots. Like he was hitting the speed bag. Bang, bang, bang. I've been fighting since I was like 11 years old, boys clubs, and always dreaming to be a champion. Always dreaming to be a professional fighter. And now I'm a champion. A couple days after this tremendous upset victory, DeMarco says, my left hand is still sore, I can't fight. But DeMarco had signed a contract. His manager, Rip Valenti, made sure he kept up his end of the bargain. And in 70 days, he was to meet Basilio for the title. They couldn't deny me. They had to give me a title fight eventually. I was confident that I would win the title, but it wasn't easy. June 10, 1955, Carmen Basilio challenges Tony DeMarco for the welterweight championship of the world. It was a savage fight. Absolutely savage. It was just a Pier 6 brawl. It was a tough fight. Hard. Um, he had knocked me down once. I just couldn't lay back and let him set the pace. I had to keep forcing him, make him move, make him work. Eventually, uh, it caught up with him. I ran him out of gas, and I started nailing him. The challenger, Basilio, is ripping into him with all he's got. That's all. The referee stops the fight at 1 minute and 52 seconds of the 12th round. Carmen Basilio wins the welterweight championship of the world. He said, I'll never forget it. I just cried in the corner. I did it, I did it, I did it, he said. And his mother climbed into the ring and she kissed her son. I was afraid she'd get hurt. Trip coming through the ropes or something because she's such a short little thing. She's only four foot ten. She explained to me, she said, you know, we worked too hard. I said, what dreams did you have? She said, we had no dreams. What could we dream about the way we lived? And that was behind that embracing scene when he won the title. After the uh, DeMarco fight, uh, they started to refer to Basilio as the man of courage. No, oh, he's a champion of all time, right? So uh, Blinky's after me. He wants a Saxon fight now, see? We've got the round robin, see? So I'm down in New York with Gabe Genovese and we're at a Gallagher Steakhouse. We're having dinner for Blinky's there. So Blinky's going, well, come on, Pally, what are you going to do here? What are we going to do? And he goes, I'll tell you what. We'll take $10,000 off the gate. See, I'm learning now, understand? We'll give it to you. And we'll go in Boston and fight Tony DiMarco. We'll have a sellout over there. We'll all make money. Yeah, that's a good idea. He said, all right, so that's how we got the second fight in, in Boston. 
a 15-round World's Welterweight Championship bout, matched by the International Boxing Club, James Dean Orr as president. Between the champion, Carmen Basilio of Canastota, New York, and the challenger, Tony DeMarco of Boston, Massachusetts. 30 seconds to go in the seventh round. And a smacking left hook. And Carmen Basilio's knees are of rubber. DeMarco trying to put across the big one. He staggered me in the seventh round with a good left hook. I saw that punch coming from a mile away. Never made an attempt to block it or get out of the way. I hit him flush. His eyes rolled over his head and his knees crossed. And I waited for him to go down. He didn't go down. I just said, don't go down, don't go down. You're in Boston. If you go down, they'll stop the fight without even counting. And I just fought it and moved and moved and moved. And then I just worked my way around. So when the bell rang, I just turned around and sat down. I was in my own corner. Basilio regained his senses and took control, flooring DeMarco twice and finally draining the life out of him. This fight, a duplicate of the one last June the 10th, as Carmen Basilio smashes Tony DeMarco into a helpless condition to have the fight called to a halt in the 12th round on a TKO. The winner and still well away champion of the world, Carmen Basilio. Now that DeMarco had lost twice to Basilio, it was Johnny Saxton's turn to take his shot. Carmen was offered the chance to fight Saxton in Chicago. There was no uh, clause in it for rematch. So I think really reluctantly, uh, he went to Chicago to fight Saxton. I was never comfortable in Chicago. On fight night, Basilio was a two to one favorite, but referee Frank Gilmer reminded him of why Chicago wasn't his kind of town. He wouldn't let me fight inside where I was strongest, and uh, he let Saxon do the running to keep us apart. And then in the fourth round, he come out, and the stuffing was coming out of his glove. Saxon's glove got ripped after Carmen uh, really hurt him, and for some reason they couldn't find another glove for 15 or 20 minutes. And he recovered and ran like a deer for the rest of the fight. There was a little hanky pan going on in that deal. The judge's decision goes to Johnny Saxton. I remember him telling me that he left Chicago uh, with a broken heart. Back in New York, Basilio secured a rematch. Behind the scenes, the usual greasing of the palms took place when Gabe Genovese collected from Basilio's managers and from the fight's promoter, Norm Rothschild. Most boxing experts agree that Basilio's biggest asset is his excellent physical condition. Still bitter from his defeat, Basilio trained harder than ever. This time out against Saxton, he would leave no doubt about the winner. Basilio had mended his broken heart, taking back the title from Saxton and the mob. Jim Norris made a mint on the fight, but his control over boxing was about to crack. In 1957, Jim Norris ran into a roadblock when a New York federal court found the IBC in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and ordered it to dissolve. Bob, all I can say is we're naturally disappointed with the decision. You plan to make any appeal? That will be in the hands of our counsel. When we have the type reports of the Judge Ryan's decree, we'll go over them point by point and then be advised by counsel. With an appeal in the works, Norris went ahead with his next big fight. Carmen Basilio versus a man who was bigger, badder, and bolder than the mob, Sugar Ray Robinson. Well, Sugar Ray was training to fight Jake LaMotta for LaMotta's middleweight, world middleweight title in 1951 he was training up in Pompton Lakes New Jersey and the phone rang one day and he answered it and uh, the voice said Ray he said yes he said this is Mr. Gray I want to talk to you I'll be down outside the gate in about half an hour Ray said okay so he went down and there was a big black sedan the window came down and Frankie Carbo's face was in the window and he said Ray I got a deal for you you win the first fight Jake wins the second and the third will be on the level 
And Ray said, I'm sorry, I just don't do business that way. Robinson and Basilio shared a loathing for the mob, but oddly enough, had little respect for one another. He had an arrogance about him that I couldn't stand. So there was never any love between he and I. It was Labor Day weekend, 1952, and my wife had never been to New York City. We're walking down Broadway, this big Cadillac pulls up. It was Ray Robinson and his entourage. I walked over and I introduced myself and they gave me the biggest brush off. And I felt so embarrassed. And I said, I'm gonna fight that son of a bitch and kick his ass someday. Five years later, I finally got a crack at him. Early in the afternoon, the welterweight champion heads into Alexandria Bay, a vacation village in the Thousand Islands region. He is a real local hero, and the people of this small town will all be at the fight en masse. Robinson won't win any popularity contests around Carmen's camp, since Basilio's end of the purse was cut 5% in order to meet Robinson's demand for a bigger guarantee. Well, he's been a little...